Hello, I'm Keith Spira from NOLA.com and the Times-Picayune. Welcome to Let's Talk. My guest today routinely tears up stages with her potent blues-based style of electric guitar. If you saw her open for Ed Sheeran at the 2023 New Orleans Jazz Fest, then, as Big Frida would say, you already know. She'll spend most of the fall on tour across the United States, but comes home to headline the second night of the Crescent City Blues and Barbecue Festival downtown in Lafayette Square on Saturday, October 14th. Please welcome Samantha Fish. Samantha, hey, thank you for going? being here. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me. You bet. So let's talk about that Jazz Fest gig first sure. off. You yeah. weren't supposed to open for Ed Sheeran nope. at the festival. You were supposed to be on the Gentilly stage on the opposite end of the fairgrounds and then Tell us what happened. Well, um, we got a call like 30 minutes before we were supposed to play. We already had all of our, you know, the gear loaded on. We were, everybody was unpacked, ready to go. And Quint Davis called my manager and said, hey, do you guys think you might be able to switch stages? And we didn't really know what was going on, but of course, you know, when Quint calls, it's like, of course, we're gonna do whatever needs to happen to make it happen. But I mean, I, it was, I had a lot of people tell me like, oh, we had to run over to see him. Like, I had to run over there too. I mean, we were, <laughs> I was like pulling on a shoe as we were walking on stage and <laughs> it was really just like that, you know? Well, the reason it had to happen was because sadly the revivalists were supposed to be in that slot right yeah. before Ed Sheeran on the main stage and then David Shaw, the lead vocalist that morning, woke up without a voice essentially. So, and, and David has been on the show to talk about what happened, but he was hoarse so literally they could not perform and yeah. it was supposed to be, you know, a big gig for them right in front of Sheeran in front of this I huge know. crowd on the main stage. So, I, I guess, yeah, mixed feelings for you, you're like, excited for the opportunity but also felt bad. Totally. I mean, we've all been there. I mean, as a vocalist, it's like the one thing. I tell people all the time I could break a finger and still be able to go out and do <laughs> something on the guitar, but when your voice goes, it's gone and there's just, you know, the only thing that fixes it is time and rest and, you know, everything you're supposed to do. And But it, it is, it's the worst feeling in the world. I, I've been there, I've been there a few times myself, so I, you know, that was like you said, bittersweet. It was nice to get, you know, it's nice to play Jazz Fest. Every crowd's a good crowd. Sure. You know, we were just happy to be there for sure. And you, uh, you know, plenty confident enough to walk on in front of that big crowd in front of Sheeran's people. Yeah, I mean, we, <laughs> that stage is, it, I've, I've done that stage now a couple times and, you know, it, it always, it's always a little bit like, you know, you're staring out the sea of people and you're like, well, I've got a pretty big job to do right now. How do I engage <laughs> with this many people who are that far away and that vast and, um, you know, you just you just dig deep and find the energy, and you know, just just go do it. Do you, you know, when you're playing a, a big festival crowd like that versus a, a club a show? I mean, do you is there a different philosophy that you bring to it? Is it a different kind of set, or are you kind of doing what you do and hope it translates to whatever the crowd is? I mean, definitely when you're in a smaller venue, you know, you have a little more opportunity to do something a little more intimate, and people generally will will grab onto that but yeah when you play a big festival crowd you have to I mean th you have to you have to rise to that as well <laughs> so I mean I, I definitely write the show to be energetic I mean we definitely I always try to take dips in the show dynamically but you just choose your moment carefully and you got to wait until you know you've got them yeah to take that kind of a you know step back or you know to bring the energy down as we tape this, um, you've gotten an invitation to perform at Eric Clapton's Crossroads Festival. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which is a bit of a, you know, an, an anointing as a guitarist, the fact that Clapton has invited you to be part of the, uh, you know, guitar all-star band yeah. that comes to this festival. Um, it's gonna make you feel good to get that kind of uh, I mean, reach out. Of course, yeah. Uh, again, we got an email from him. From Eric Clapton himself. Yeah, and, be, and I, I didn't think it was real. I was like, this isn't, this isn't a real email. This is like some kind of hoax. Um, and but it was, and he he invited me to come out and play, and I I'm just I'm really thrilled, you know. I mean, this is something I've looked I, I've looked at the Crossroads show for years. I mean, when they came out with the DVD, like mm -hmm. in 20, 2009, 2010, something like that. I mean, I just I remember watching that, going like, God, it would wouldn't that just be something, you know? And now here we are, <laughs> going to do it, and it it feels great. I mean, it's it's really, you know, kind of a pat on the back, and I feel like. Okay, maybe you know I'm doing the right things. And, yeah. yeah. If you hadn't figured that out yet, yes, you're doing the right thing. <laughs> but you know, you know what I mean. Like you have these little reassurances along the way. You're like, okay, I'm on the right path. This is good. This, you know, good right. things are coming. You need affirmations every now and then. Every once in a while. Because yeah, else. I mean, it's you know, everybody sees you on stage and it looks like a lot of fun and glory. But I mean, you know, slogging down the road. I mean, you're going to spend most of this fall on tour, bouncing yeah. around a lot. So I mean, there, you know, and it's not easy. It's not an easy job. 
It's a lot of hard work. People only see the the really cool part of it, and you know, I mean, but that's the whole reason I do it is because that really cool part of it. And but you know, it is. It's a twenty four seven career choice. <laughs> Any musician will tell you. I mean, you're in it. Yeah. 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 And you make certain sacrifices to do it. I mean, 100%, you're, you're gone. Yeah. You know, for weeks on end. Um, yep. You know. I know. Do you do you still have a cat? You had a cat at some point. You still, <laughs> yeah. He's who, doing. He's what does he do when you're gone? What does he? You do? know, he pays the bills. <laughs> He uh, <laughs> cleans up the house. He keeps things great. Under He's control. in charge. Wow! Yeah. Wow! Yeah. That's good. good yeah, it's good, great. Good. Um, well, let's take it back. You've been here in New Orleans. Let's see. How many years now? Six. Six years. I think six. Six and a half, almost. God. Yeah, yeah. You grew up in Kansas City. Mm-hmm. Um, was that a place to uh, nurture dreams of being a blues guitar player? Yeah, and of course. And I, I think, like any scene, there's there's always an ebb and flow you know, when things are really hot, and I was coming up at a really hot time, there was a lot of bands coming mm -hmm. out of Kansas City and going on tour and, you know, building building something, so there was a lot of fire there. And and also, Kansas City is a very nurturing place. Like, mm -hmm. that, you know, I, I, was, I was embraced with open arms by my peers out there, and, you know, people were very quick and, uh, you know, to let, to let you come sit in or share a stage, you know, so you could grow and hone your craft and, you know, I, I cut my teeth in Kansas City. I, I learned a lot. All those things you described sound a lot of like playing in New Orleans as of well. Of course, Like yeah. people sit in and share stages and all that sort of stuff. I, I mean, came so. to another nice city too, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, so what actually set you on the path though, to be a musician? I mean, could, was that a, uh, was there a history in the family of people playing or was that kind of something you struck out on your own? Well, my, yeah, I mean, music was always a part of my life. You know, it was always there in the background. My dad played guitar, all my uncles played guitar, my, you know, their friends, everybody was a guitar player around me. Um, you know, and my mother sang in church, all my, you know, just the whole family, aunts, all singers, my grandmother sang, you know, so I didn't really think anything of it, um, that that was a unique experience, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, also growing up in Kansas City, kind of having this like, you know, blues and jazz background there, like it kind of pushed me in this direction, you know, when if I wanted to go and sit in with people and learn how to play guitar with the group, it was like, okay, well, you kind of have to learn something in the tradition. So I yeah. started learning blues, you know, standards and songs and figuring out how to express myself and solo and emote. But, you know, I think the moment for me was the very first time I was, I was kind of thrust into the situation to go on a stage. I'd never been on a stage before. I'd never performed in front of people before. I was actually pretty shy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I don't know. I, I was at a backyard party, and I was checking out a guitar that one of the musicians was playing. It was a guy named Greg Camp. And he put it in my hand. He said, well, why don't you go play something for these people? And I didn't even have time to like freak out and say no, because if I did, I wouldn't have done it. Right. Um, but I, and the experience was terrible. It was like horrible and awful and scary, and I probably did terrible, but I remember that feeling of being like, oh, I have to do this again. I was hooked to the stage. Like, I wanted to be a performer from then on. And that sets you on the road. Yeah. Um, if you could stage fright at the Clapton thing, maybe somebody would <laughs> shove a guitar in your hand and push you out there as well, so. Uh. I've, I've, you know, I've had, I, I've got a good relationship with my stage fright now. I mean, I use it to my advantage. I'm like, okay, it's, it's just because you care, and you, you know, you go out there and you just, it, you let it fuel you as, instead of inhibit you. Right. The energy, yeah. you get, you draw an energy from it. Yeah. It's a good thing. It means you care. That's exactly yeah. right. I like that. I like that. Um, so, what would, talk about the decision to move here. Then, what was it that brought you to New Orleans? Well, I've been infatuated with New Orleans since I was you know, a teenager, we came down here once on a vacation and I was like, oh, this place is so cool. And then I started reading about, you know, like the music down here. And, and I, I just I just started coming down more and more and more. And I ended up, you know, coming I, coming up in Kansas City, I would go to this club a lot and I'd see, you know, artists come through like Tab Benoit. Mm. And I South Louisiana up, guitarist. Yeah, Tab and Benoit, Mike yep. Zito and, yep. and all these people. And that's how I ended up meeting Ruben Williams, who's a manager down here. Mm -hmm. And um, he ended up managing me, but when I when I was putting a band together, I knew that um, I wanted to put some people together from New Orleans. I was looking to make a change, and so it just felt like the right place to be for me. You know, it just felt like I just felt compelled to come here, and you know, and I, I knew logistically it made sense because of the band, and so I, I took the leap, and I'm really glad I did because I, I love it here. Well, and it seems like it's been a great place for you career-wise. I mean, yeah. your, your gigs at Jazz Fest have brought you to, a, I think, a whole new audience. Um, I mean, I remember a show at the Blues Tent you did a few years ago. I think maybe it was your first time at the Blues Tent, and that uh -huh. was really like a, an eye-opening moment, I think, for a lot of people that saw you at that, that show. It was like, oh, wow, you know, she's for real. Yeah, I mean, I, I, 
I was embraced relatively quickly, and I, I mean, that, that feels good too, you know. I, I kind of keep a low profile and, you know, uh, coming in and playing Jazz Fest, which is like just a world-class festival, um, you know, and, and it, it attracts real music fans, you know. And not you know not just from New Orleans but all over the world. Mm -hmm. So I mean honestly, Jazz Fest has helped me all over the world, as well as in New Orleans. You know it, it's it's been um, you know it's been really good for me. And you've set down roots here. I mean you bought a house, right? I, I mean, did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why do you laugh? Why is that? It was just it was a crazy experience. Like it was <laughs> a time when real estate was insane and. You know, uh, I, I don't know, it was like kind of a whirlwind, something to, I'd never done anything like that before, so it was new, you know. You came down here and grew up. Uh, in a way, in, yeah, in a lot of ways. Bought a house and, uh, you know, and uh, so, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, do you think you're here for the long haul? I mean, or, or is it, you just kind of going by day? Because we talked some years back and you were kind of thinking, oh, you know, I'll be here for a while, but I don't know, you know I, what I mean? You know, I don't know. I mean, I, I definitely feel like it's home. Mm -hmm. um, I can't see myself getting called away, you know. Um, but life happens. I, 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 I but I, I love it here, you know. I mean, I just can't really see leaving, you know. My wife also is from Kansas City. Went to high school there, and yeah. uh, she came down here thought just for college, uh, and then she was going to move, and she's still here 30 years later. So it happens. Yeah, you know, it yeah. happens. It happens. It happens. Um, Talk a little bit about how you think your style has evolved as a guitar player, because I mean, I, I feel like you do a lot of different things. I mean, you can play the really hardcore blues stuff, but you yeah. also do, you know, you're a really good songwriter and do the more kind of um, uh, low key stuff. Maybe I don't know. That's what we're like singer songwriter. Singer songwriter, subtle yeah. things. Thank you very much. You yeah. should be a music critic. That was good. <laughs> um, good so yeah, so just, yeah, just talk a little bit about, about you know about your style and how how it's kind of evolved. Uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of rock and roll, too. I mean, blues is the cornerstone of everything I do. It's the foundation. But I, I try and sprinkle rock and roll into everything. And, um, you know, I mean, rock and roll was just as big of an influence for me growing up, you know. So I, I take a lot of inspiration from that. Um, but I, I've been really blessed to work with people. And, you know, my record label allows me to take chances. And mm -hmm. I get to kind of, you know, evolve and grow and change with each record. And I've, I've been able to do some different kind of concepty records you know yeah. I, I went to Detroit and made a an R&B soul record of you know s cover songs from the 60s and the 50s and then I went and did a the very next record was one with Luth Luther Dickinson and made a North Mississippi quasi acoustic <laughs> songwriter record you know and then everything beyond that has just been like another you know evolution and um, I, I don't know I just like I my my main goal is to just try to write good songs and bring you know bring this blues foundation to whatever i do mm -hmm. and i mean i feel like that's my job you know as somebody who's i'm a i'm a blues lover and i'm a fan of the tradition but i also you know feel like it's my job as an artist to use my voice in a unique way to help expand what we consider to be you know blues the so genre the genre right yeah. right and right. And, uh, you know, I just try to write good songs, you know, that, that catch people's attention, that capture the, you know, the human condition. And, and um, you know, and I try to put some badass guitar solos to it, too. You know? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> exactly. What's well, the thing? But it, the solos are kind of in the service of the song. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't ever really write a song like, this one's for the guitar solo. Like, I mean, <laughs> it's like you write the song and then you're like, oh, maybe there's something I can slip in here. I mean, I... I, I definitely, you know, I, I want to write songs that are standalone great songs, and then, you know, the guitar, I find my place for it, you know. You know, you're one of the people that uh, plays a thing called a cigar box guitar, yeah. which is an interesting uh, instrument. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, about what, 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 what it is, what the history of it is, and why you were attracted to this particular instrument. Well. Uh, my history with it is I, I was 17 years old and I'd gone to Helena, Arkansas for the first time to go to this King Biscuit Blues Festival mm -hmm. and they've mm -hmm. got a main stage which is amazing as national talent but they also have this thing called the Midway which people set up on the street and play music and I was just enthralled because I saw all these guys playing these cigar box guitars or like homemade it's, instruments. It's literally a, a guitar where the body is a cigar box. There's a picture of you yeah, playing one right there I think. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So I mean but it's it's like yeah just a little box and so the history of it is people that didn't, couldn't afford an actual guitar would make yeah, these things. Yeah or just like you know I mean 
there weren't many guitar shops back in the day, so I assume you know you right. just kind of worked with what you had, and people were making. I mean, it's funny because I've now been inter introduced to this entire community of builders, and people make guitars out of all kinds of stuff. Did you know? Hmm. Boat oars and shovels and stuff. It, it's crazy. <laughs> but cigar boxes, yeah, no people. I mean, they're natural resonators. I mean, an empty mm -hmm. cigar box, it's hollow. It, it it can you know act as like a little lightweight guitar. And I, I went back years later to this festival, that same one. Mm -hmm. And I was performing as an artist, so I was like, yeah, oh, I saw a guy selling them on the midway. I was like, well, I just maybe I'll just pick it up just for, you know, full circle moment. Yeah. And the first time I plugged it in, I was at some gig in Kansas City, I plugged it in, and people have not let me put it down. So it's like, just it sounds so cool. <laughs> like, the juxtaposition of this little tiny instrument, and it sounds like a chainsaw right out the right. gate. I think people are just kind of, it, it, it did the same thing to me when I first saw somebody play one that it does to people when they, you know, it's like, whoa, what is that? You know, it's just kind of, it's cool and it sounds different. And that the one I play, it's the, the first one I ever picked up and it's, I've got a relationship with it and I, <laughs> it's falling apart. Does it have a name? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't, it's a cigar box guitar. It doesn't, I don't name You don't name guitars. your guitars. You don't I have don't. a Lucille, you don't have a, yeah, yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> I, I'd probably or Lewis, I guess, if you, you know, female guitar player would have to give it a male name, I don't know. I look yeah. at them like hammers and screwdrivers. I don't want to get too attached because it's a tool that it's I'm, I'm going to beat up. And at some point it's going to be just so trashed that I'm going to have to part ways with it. So it can't have a name. That'd be too sad. That would be right, right. That would be abusive. Abusive, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. I'm impressed that the original cigar box thing that you got is still surviving. It's held to get together by um, gaff tape and like nothing else. It's oh literally, gosh. it's it's less cigar box and more tape guitar than anything. <laughs> right, it's a duct tape guitar. It's a duct tape guitar. Duct tape guitar. Duct tape guitar. Yeah. Um, for you, I guess, as with every touring musician, uh, pandemic was brutal. It used to be on the road, had to be at home. Yeah. Um, I think one of your first shows maybe coming out of the pandemic was at the Ryman Auditorium with Tad yeah. Benoit. Um, yeah. Talk about a way to come back out to play like the hallowed hall of country music in I Nashville. Know. Yeah. Um, you know, talk about that. You remember that night specifically and what, what happened and how it went down? Well, I mean, we were still doing, doing COVID, you know, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so there wasn't, I mean, they only allowed like, it, it felt like only 30 people there, but I know there were more than <laughs> right, that, but, the, right. but they were very like, I mean, they had it down exactly how they wanted it to go which, you know, Nashville was, was crazy at that time. You're in the Ryman and everything is really, um, it, it was just the juxtaposition of going in the Ryman and everybody's wearing a mask and it's, it's great. They had everybody spaced out and it was, it was well done and then you walk out onto Broadway and it's like, none of that's happening. None of that, right, 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 right. <laughs> um, so I think we were all, you know, we were all just doing the best we could with it and, um, you know, but that show was, was beautiful because I know we taped it and, um, and it just felt so nice to be able to play a place like that. You know, you're walking through the halls and they have, they, they're very proud of their history. Sure. It's, it's like a museum, you know, walking and you see everybody who's played there on, right there on the walls and in the green rooms. I'm like, I know I'm in Hank Williams' room right now. It's really cool. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's a special experience. And I've gotten the opportunity to go back um, since and to a full crowd. And, you know, th the people that come to the Ryman, you know, there's, there's just a tradition of how you you know, you engage with the performers and how you listen to music. It's very intimate and very, um, there, there's just such a, a you know, um, like we, we just, the energy flowing back and forth between the audience and the performers, it's like, it's incredible. Yeah, you feel like you're all kind of in it together, basically. Totally. It's all yeah. like, a, you're all part of the same. So even when we were doing it to, you know, the 10 people that were there, <laughs> it, was, it was actually not, it was more than 10 people, but it was, you know, it was well done. They, but they were all engaged and it was very cool. That's awesome. No, yeah. it sounds like a great gig. You know, I was a big fan of, uh, of Pat Benatar growing up. Yeah. Um, you know, and read her autobiography. And, you know, she talked about some of the things that she had to go through, you know, as a woman on the road back in the day. Yeah. I like to think we've progressed from that. But, I mean, has that been your experience? I mean, have you run into, like, you know, strangeness being a, a woman S guitar player on the road? S sexism in the music industry? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, is that, I mean, I know it's a new concept, but yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I'd say there's some of that. <laughs> But, you know, she says with understatement, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm, I mean, definitely. I, I think, you know, I, I see these young women coming up now, and I just, I feel like, you know, the women that went before me and my heroes, it's like they had to deal with so much just so I wouldn't have to deal with as much. Mm -hmm. And it's my job, you know, to, to fight for 
you know, the things that I believe in so that the people that come after me don't have to deal with some of the things that I've dealt with. And, you know, it's just, you got to go out every day and do the work and stand up for yourself and draw boundaries, draw lines, call things out when they aren't right. Um, and, you know, just keep fighting to make things better and equal. But, you know, it's not gone away. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I but I, I do think it's, you know, it's definitely better than it was back then. I have my, you know, the, pe the women that came before me to thank for that. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, that's, I mean, it's, you know, every stage, it's progress, I guess. I mean, every stage, yeah. and it's, you it know. It just takes it, time, yeah. You know, human beings are flawed, but we're never totally. gonna get it quite right, so, you know, but you keep trying, you keep trying. Yeah. Um, you've collaborated with a bunch of different artists. I mean, well, and, and even in your own band, I mean, you've shifted configurations a whole bunch over, the, you know, the, the, since you've been in town, I guess you use different bands, different mm -hmm. players. Um, is that sort of you, uh, just like in a, tried out different people and have different creative uh, surroundings around you kind of thing? Yeah, and, and it's just, it's always kind of happened like when, you know, when the time was right, you know. When, mm -hmm. I, when I did the Chills and Fever record and I would built a band mostly out of New Orleans, except we'd, I was using my longtime bass player from Austin and then um, the man we made, uh, Kenny Tudrick, we made the record with up in Detroit. And then, you know, People like sometimes things, you know, you know, like certain people will come and go, you know, they can only do a year and right. like, we work hard too. like we, we work a lot. Sometimes it's like, you know, it's too much or, it's, you know, it's too little. Everybody's different and their their needs and requirements change over time. So I sure. think, you know, if you're going to tour as much as we are, you just kind of have to accept that people will come and people go sure. and, um, and you just try to make everything as pleasant and fun as possible <laughs> in the moment, you know, uh -huh. but um, I've definitely you know, with a new record or new concept, you know, it's like, I, I want to shake it up or I want to try something different. You know, sometimes it's good to, to challenge yourself and, um, you know, and, and work with different people. Cause I'll catch myself get into, you know, a rut or something. And it's sure. like, I need to, I need to wake up and do something a little different. Um, but you know, I'm, I've, I've had a, like Ron Johnson's been in the band for quite some time. He's from New Orleans. We started working together during, the crazy COVID years. I was working with locals only. Nobody could ride a plane, and right, right, you know, right. and, and we've had a great relationship working together for a while. And um, he's a, he's the uh, drummer. Uh, he's the bass player. Bass player. Bass player. Bass player. Right. And um, you know, now that I'm doing this Death Wish project with Jesse, it was like we just wanted to create a different band for that. Um, we brought in the keyboard player from uh, New York who did the album mm -hmm. um, Death Wish Blues. We went in the studio up there and we met Mickey Finn, and and then. Um, uh, Jamie Douglas is our drummer, and he's from LA, but he worked with Jesse on his new record. So it was like every, you know, everybody knows each other from something before, and you know, come together to do this project. And it's nice, you know, it's it's the chemistry's good, and you know, um, it, it's you know, it challenges me, you know, because it makes me think outside of, you know, wh you know, my parameters and sure. my parts and. Yeah. Right, and Jesse, Jesse Dayton, guitar player, yeah. is, is who yeah, Sorry, we're talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, but no, so, and that's been a, 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 an ongoing collaboration. When y'all do those shows, I mean, you're kind of, you're all on stage at some point together, right? Trading yeah. guitar oh, lights. Oh, the, the, yeah, the whole show. The whole show, yes. Well, that show is, is we, we wanted to, to do something that was going to be like marked a uh, difference from our solo shows. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we wrote an entire album together. John Spencer produced it. Um, and, and we've been doing this kind of duets tour and I'm, I'm going off on a solo tour and, uh, and that's gonna be great and different all, but, but this Death Wish tour is totally different from my solo tour. Different material, all that. Right, yeah. right, right. And your solo tours, I mean, that's a little bit, you sample a little bit of everything. I mean, do you, you write out a, a fresh set list every night kind of thing? Um, well, this, this is the first solo tour I've done since we started the Death Wish Blues tour, like mm -hmm. this, this one I'm getting ready to go out and call it Love Letters Tour. Um, and I, I just was trying to challenge myself to pull things from different records. It's the first, it's the first set list I've written that wasn't album centric. Mm -hmm. Like my latest album, I have to write the whole sh show around that, and then we'll sprinkle in a couple things. This one's I'm, I'm actually just like picking from different eras of my career, and um, you know that's been kind of fun. It's like, the Samantha revisit. Fish retrospective. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> some good, some some's good, some's uh, some's good. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We grow. Um, well, on stage, you always have a chance to make the songs better, so you can. Oh you can make, yeah, 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 I mean yeah. that's it, that's the fun part about it is going and reimagining the material that you know, like I wrote the song eight years ago about something totally different, but now I've like lived and I've experienced, like you know, I'm like oh wow, I'm, I've experienced the song now in, in a different way, and <laughs> right, you know, and and you can reimagine it with different instrumentation. You know, everybody brings their own spin to it. It's it's fun. I like it. We've just got a minute and a half left here. Okay. I want to talk about the Crescent City Blues and Barbecue Festival real yeah. quick. You're headlining the big stage on the Saturday night. Yes. Um, another little feather in the cap, I'd say, there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a big deal. It's nice. It's going to be great. Going to have some hardcore blues fans there, and, um, you know, I'm honored to be a part of it. Play a little bit more uh, blues guitar maybe at that one since so the nature of the, the, the festival? or Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Probably uh, so. Yeah, no, and yeah, but again, that's like literally you're popping in and then you're off again to Europe, like right after the yeah. festival. And uh, like the next day, uh, we were off and then we fly to Dublin. So. Oh my gosh. Whew. And how many dates in Europe? Uh, there's it's only eleven dates, you know. So it's only it's only eleven it's, shows, but it it's it's a good word. We're, we're hitting the whole UK, so I'm excited. Well, uh, hopefully your cat takes good care of your house while you're gone. He's doing pretty good. He's yeah. Good, he's got it. We got on lockdown. He's got, he's so got it on. It's got so a lot well, um, Samantha, this has been great. I mean, I hope folks go out and see you at the Blues Festival. I hope they catch you at Jazz Fest next year because I'm sure you'll be back. Yeah. Um, you know, and I just wish you well with all the records and everything you got coming out. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to everyone watching. Once again, I am Keith Spearer from NOLA.com and the Times Picayune. This has been Let's Talk. We'll see you next week.